to juggle all in high school. Pretty rural, um, but as you know, Virginia had talked about earlier, technology is a huge part of where we're at in education. And so in taking technology, I've really implemented what's called blended learning in my classroom. And so if we think about technology in the classroom, really the key thing is how we use technology. You know that technology is important for our students to know, to learn, to be able to use in the future. But like Virginia alluded to, we can very easily substitute things, very easily augment things. But in order to actually transform our classrooms and to get technology to actually enhance what we do, we need to be down to the modification and redefinition of Dr. Pentadero's SAMR model here. And so when we think about using technology, we really need to have purposeful use. It's not just about another text tool. It's not about just doing it because the kids like it. It's about learning how to use it in a way that actually individualizes learning and helps our students get to where they need to be. This is where blended learning comes in. So we know that there is a ton of online education right now. We could put a kid on a computer and they could probably get everything that we are going to teach them. It's very individualized. They can learn at their own pace. They can learn what they want to learn. But there's also great value in being in a classroom, having face-to-face -face conversations, and brick and mortar schools. Like, we don't want to be replaced, right? So, blended learning takes both of those aspects. It takes that individualized aspect of online learning, takes the personalized aspect of in the school brick and mortar, and combines them together to get the best aspects out of both. And so what this looks like, it's not just about giving kids technology and saying, go do this, I'll talk to you about it later. It is very purposeful in looking at kids having choice in what they do. So blended learning, again, combines that traditional classroom with the online aspect, but there's three key things that go with it. Case, place, and path. Students get a choice in each of those three. So you're gonna look at place. The students get to decide where they want to learn certain things. Pace. The students get to decide how quickly they're going to go through certain things. And path. The students get to decide what they're going to do first. They get to really evaluate how they learn, what activities are going to get them there first, get them to learn the content better, and they get to have choice in how they go about that. So what this kind of looks like, if you're implementing the place. So this one for me was one of the easier ones to implement because um, I've been flipping my classroom now for five or six years. And just in having those videos online, kids could learn at home, at home. They could go out in the hall and watch the video. They could watch in other classes. I often have other teachers that end up watching my videos and telling me that they learned stuff. But just by putting what I used to do when I was a very young, naive teacher, when I would lecture all hour, I concised it down to 10 minutes or less, put it on video. Now the kids can take it whenever. Some of my kids watch it in class. They don't have internet at home, so they can't watch that video in class. Some watch it in different classes, some watch it at home. But it changes where, that they, where they can learn. The other thing that I did was I wrote a ton of grants to make my classroom flexible. I wanted different seating so that my kids were not stuck in rows and groups. So I have, in this bottom picture here, you can see I have what's called node chairs from steel paste. So there's a desk that rolls. And yes, for the first week, kids think this is the greatest thing in the world. They're all over the place. But once you get the classroom norm norms down, they really understand how to use them. And it is amazing to watch them pair up with somebody, talk about things, realize they don't understand something, and they roll over here. For some reason, kids think that rolling is less work than standing up and just walking over something. Um, I also have been very fortunate to have this little area outside my room. There used to be lockers in there, but I convinced my administration to take the lockers out, and I wrote grant for some furniture, so we have some high top tables, we've got some kind of cushy chairs there. But kids, when they need a quieter place to study, they go out to that area, it's called my learning lounge, and they can go out there and have some quiet time to actually think. The science classroom gets kind of crazy, we're doing engineering projects and labs, and so if kids need quiet to really think about things, they go out to the learning lounge or go out to the hall. In implementing the pace, this was probably the hardest part for me. Like how do you give kids that control over how fast they move without them thinking, oh, I don't want to do this today, and it's at my own pace, so it's okay. And that's when I first implemented that's what it looked like. It took a lot of training to get kids to understand that pace means it's your pace of learning. 
So typically, when we think about education, we constrict the time, and that leads to variable mastery of topics. Blended learning flips that. So we want to ensure the mastery of the topics, and so I'm going to give variable time. I have kids, I call my pop pops first time my quiz. I have flexible deadlines, because some kids get things like that. Just like my microwave comes super, super fast. Those kids can get done, they can move on, they're not hindered. But then I have my crop pops. They need more time. They have to stew on it. They have to think about it. They need to talk to me a couple times about it before they actually understand it. And so in having flexible deadlines and having them be kind of self-paced and learn at their own learning pace, then they can move to where they need and ensure that mastery. Um, I have a lot of targeted small group discussions. So bringing those kids who are my lower level and having that self-paced, my high flyers, or no, it's all set up so that they can go. My low kids, I sit down, I talk, two on one, three on one, one on one, so that they can get more help and get the understanding that they need. I usually have like a three-day window for labs. So some kids might be behind. They're seeing the lab as kind of an introduction. It's almost just like an experience that they're going to get to so they can apply their knowledge where they're at. Some of my kids are past it, so they are kind of looking at the lab and applying new knowledge already. Some of my kids are right there at the lab, and so they're able to see it in different places. I also have, they choose where their lab is, so they can choose to do the lab first or last because of that window. And because it is self-paced, I have a couple kids who are just my super high flyers. They get done with things in what it would be a two-week unit. They can get done in five days. So they can take that next week, and they are working on independent science research projects in my class. So I have one student that has always been hindered by everyone else. She is now, this, this year she did a research project on trying to convert leaf waste into ethanol, because she could get done with everything that we are learning, still understand it, but now she has that extra week where she used to just have to wait for the rest of the class. Um, then that last part, implementing the path. This is giving kids choice in how they go about things. So what I basically did is I took everything that I used to do, where I used to do a lecture, then we would do a practice, then we would do a lab. I took all those things that had common goals to what they were learning, and I just grouped them together, and I now let the kids decide what they want to do first. And as we're going through this, kids really learn how they learn. They figure out that they're very hands-on, and they go do the lab first. Or I have some kids that are very auditory. They go and watch the notes first. I have some kids that are very, um, they like to read, so they go do readings first. But they have all these choices that they can do in order to get to the same spot, in order to get to the same goal, but we're giving kids that power in how they want to learn and how they learn best. So they choose that. I make choice boards using HyperDocs and using my learning management system. And so for safety, lab safety, they have to do a safety, choose one in the lab safety column. They have to choose one in the, uh, lab equipment column, we have to choose one in the variable column. This was just real quick at the beginning of the year. This is what we all have to review before we really get going. Um, I have kids make to-do lists, so I give them their entire week's worth of assignments and they need to look at it, think about how they learn, um, they need to think about what their time is. Being in a small school, my kids are gone all the time, so they write down what days are going to be gone, what days they need to do labs, they make a to-do list for the week. And I give them multiple assessment options. So yes, I still give normal tests just because I know I want my kids to be prepared for that in college. However, I also want to know that they know things. And so I give them options of how they want to show me that they know things. And oftentimes that's using technology in a way that they choose. So they might be doing a flip grid explanation. They might be doing an animation. They might be doing a thing like a Canva, book creator, iMovies. They have tons of opportunities to choose something that's their choice and show me what they know. Um, so this is just real quick what a blended lesson might look like. I have, I teach chemistry, advanced chemistry, physics, anatomy, I have a science capstone class, so I teach a lot of different things. I teach some that are phenomenon based, some that are problem based, and they all work around blended learning. So for example, in my chemistry class it's more phenomenon based, I might start with a phenomenon like applied metals and water demonstration or you might do a March Madness element bracket, just the Flint activity. We do that activity together. We have those ideas that are elicited. We have those common experiences. And then we take those, they get to explore. And they have the choices of how they explore. 
So they might grab it and analyze it, they might read about it, they might actually build something, but they get that choice. Then they get to explain and practice it. This is where I might have something that they have to do. So just to make sure that they've got the explore concepts I wanted them to get, I'll have some longer check-ins. They'll have the flipped notes that they go over and watch. And then they'll have some practice things that they get options again. They might do quizzes, they might do an interactive worksheet, they might physically play element war with somebody else. And then finally, the elaborator evaluate, they're going to choose that project. They're going to have that task assessment that shows me what they know. And finally, as I've implemented this, I really have seen immense changes. First off, kids are empowered. They are so used to coming into class and being told what to do, sitting there, absorbing information. Yes, they might have got to do labs, they might have got to do activities, but it's still stuff that they were told to do. Now that the fact that they come in, they have this option, they have a menu that they get to choose from, they're empowered by it, and they take charge of it. They really start thinking about how they learn best and choosing what's best for them that week. They are taking ownership. This is leading to kids teaching other kids. I see this all the time. And the rolling chairs for me are working amazingly, like how I pictured it, because they are just rolling to each other. It's a fun thing to, for them to do. For, like I said, it, it's used in physical therapy, the rolling chairs, so they think that it's not work, and it is work, but I guess it's more fun than walking. Um, but the, the kind of increased time management skills, I was blown away when I started implementing them, like making a checklist on a sticky note. I thought that they would throw them away first thing. Those kids kept those sticky notes all week long crossed things off and were bad when they lost them. So nobody's ever really taught them anymore. We don't have the planners anymore. They don't have that time management anymore to actually make a list and prioritize what they need to get done. I have fewer students left behind. I have very upper level classes and teach them very hard classes in chemistry, advanced chemistry, physics. There used to be tons of kids failing. Now the fact that I'm able to do small groups, I'm able to bring them along and I can reach those and it's just variable, and that choice has really led to fewer kids in the field. Uh, my advanced students are not come back. Students are learning how they learn, which as they go on in the world, that is so important. I wish I would have known how I learned when I got to college, because I got to organic chem, and I'm still trying to memorize everything instead of you know, trying to actually learn stuff. But learning how they learn is a key skill, it's a life skill. And really, we just have more time for doing science. When I'm not lecturing, when I'm not trying to keep everybody as a group, everybody's doing science. It may be different science every day in every class. And it is craziness. It's like watching the ocean in my room where kids roll in and tuck in, and some are in the lab, and some are over here. But everybody's doing something, everybody's engaged. So it has been a huge change for the Any questions? Here's